Welcome, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, as Clara just indicated, uh, today's session is looking at employees as opposed to independent contractors. So what we're going through is making sure that you understand uh, what the difference is and how to choose the right type of worker for the roles that you need to fill or, or get people to complete within your business. And uh, the additional extension to that is why it is so important that you get it right from the start. Okay, so contractor or employee, what is the risk? Um, so the key reason why we as uh, advisors to business are so uh, beating our drum, so to speak, in relation to making sure that people understand what an employee and what an independent contractor is, because there are quite uh, different uh, legal requirements. And if you get it wrong, um, from a legal perspective, there is significant risk and penalties that uh, can be at play. Um, and really, when we start looking at who is a contractor and who is an employee, um, a lot of times people say, well, you know, it's clear in the, in the contract with them that they're, uh, that they're an independent contractor, uh, not an employee. However, um, as you'll see as I go through today's webinar, the label that we attach to the employment relationship is not enough. Um, and the courts will actually dig down behind that label to look at how the parties have behaved. So uh, the question does become one of substance and not simply the form that we attach to it. Uh, and the key bit, uh, because there are many times here at Nat Road, um, Richard, myself, um, we've had to work with members um, where the situation has been uh, incorrectly applied. And, um, you know, again, we try to minimize the financial implications, but at the end of the day, uh, it's better to get it right at the beginning rather than trying to fix it once the wheels have fallen off, so to speak. The other important part is that uh, this term sh sham contracting has been enshrined in the Fair Work Act, so it's enshrined at law. Uh, and if you are deemed to have engaged in sham contracting, um, that is calling a relationship something different to what it is, um, it carries large penalties, not only for your business, but you uh, as a director or employer um, as an individual. Um, there's also then, while I'll be focusing largely on uh, the industrial law perspective, um, there are also then implications from a PAYG perspective, superannuation and workers' compensation. And each of, the, each of these areas in their own right uh, also contain um, quite significant penalties if you get it wrong. So again, drawing down a little bit further, who is an employee and in fact, what is a contractor? And I've made that distinction at the start because uh, they are in fact two different considerations. As I've said, it's important from uh, an employing perspective or an engagement perspective to make sure that you understand the legal distinction uh, and this is through the common law element. Common law is that law which is developed over the years by uh, matters coming before the court. Um, so the distinction is drawn through the common law and the different classes of worker uh, do have different treatments in differing contexts from a legal and government authority perspective. As I said, PAYG, superannuation, uh, workers' comp are uh, but a few of those other ones. Um, as I said, because it is common law, um, there is no clear cut. It, if you were to contact us, we could not give you an absolute definitive, this is what an employee is and this is what a contractor is. 
uh, the very nature of this is that there are some guidelines, some indicia, as we call them. However, again, uh, large, sometimes it does come down to uh, the very individual uh, circumstances between the hirer and the worker. Um, even where on first glance matters are common, um, there can be quite often different outcomes uh, if the matter goes before a tribunal or a court. And as I've said, uh, simply describing workers as contractors in a document representing what the, cash, uh, what the uh, engagement or employment relationship is, uh, does, not <clears throat> excuse me, does not necessarily mean um, when the wheels fall off and the parties end up before a court or uh, other finder of fact, that um, it will automatically play that if it's deemed a contractor in the paperwork, then it's a contractor that it will be found to be. Um, and it's not just where the parties do get into dispute. Oftentimes um, in those other areas of law, um, you, will, you could be audited by a government regulator, a government authority, uh, and then found to be in breach of various legislation. Um, the other element there is also, it can come down to who is responsible for the worker's actions. Um, so, uh, and again, I've, in this slide, I've used the word principal rather than employer, uh, because in a contracting relationship, it is a principal and an independent contractor. Um, you can be vicariously liable for the actions of an employee, but typically, uh, and not always, but typically um, you, it, it is a bigger bow to draw to become very vicariously liable for the actions of a true independent contractor because they are an entity uh, governing themselves, so to speak. Okay, now, one of the things I thought I would include this, and I acknowledge the source, this is actually from the Australian Taxation Office website. Um, there are actually uh, more details on their website, um, but I thought given the conversations that we often have with our members, um, I thought this is a good way to cover off some of those uh, elements uh, and the misconceptions that are unfortunately out there. So. Um, what, what we've done is we've turned the myths and um, I'll take you through a few of those that, uh, that we do often confront. Um, and the first one comes from the fact, uh, many a time we have the conversation, but the, but the driver has their own ABN and they want to be engaged as a contractor. And in fact, uh, I've had a case where in the uh, driver in fact had set up um, the ABN with the wife, uh, spouse being involved in it and everything. Um, however, at the end of the day, whether or not you have an ABN is not relevant as to whether a worker can subsequently be found to be an employee or an independent contractor. Uh, the other sort of one is, oh, but everyone's doing it. Everyone's taking them on as contractors or the bloke down the local BP service station said I can. Um, the, the rule of thumb is here is simply that fact, just because someone else is doing it doesn't mean it's right for you or more in particular that they have got it right to begin with. Uh, again, employees can't be used for short term jobs. Well, in fact, again, that makes no impact as to whether you're engaging a contractor or an employee. Uh, for those people who are really getting into the taxation side of things, uh, the 80-20 rule, uh, and in fact, uh, in that area of law, um, it's not one of those hard and fast consideration rules. Um, also the fact, again, uh, you know, in the, in the industry, we do have in fact members who uh, the companies or the business have actually been established by 
um, be it grandparents, parents, uh, and they've now become the directors uh, and the employer, so to speak. Um, and that's the point. Uh, just simply because this is something the business has always done um, is not relevant in, it may not be relevant in today's law and the bars that we are actually having to meet uh, within the industry. Uh, also then extending from the ABN argument around a registered business name, uh, again, it is one of those myths out there. And at the end of the day, it's one of the factors that could come into play, but it's not a determining factor. Uh, the same sort of thing, the myth is, you know, if, if they're a contractor for one job, they'll be a contractor for all jobs. Nope, sorry, we've got to look at it in each and every circumstance uh, when we engage a worker. Uh, the other one then, you know, oh, but we only should take on contractors, that way then we don't have the obligations of an employer for the purposes of tax, superannuation, etc. Um, the thing is, it still comes down to, even with some contractors, depending upon what you're actually engaging them to do, you may still have to make superannuation contract uh, contributions for them. Um, and again, uh, unfortunately, sometimes that is uh, a hidden sting in the tail. Um, I think I've already covered that next one off. You know, my worker wants to be a contractor, the same sort of thing as or I've got an ABN, want to be there. Um, it's not the case. Uh, if the worker submits an invoice for their work, they're a contractor. Um, again, it it is one of the factors or indicia that uh, could be considered, but it's not a determining one. Uh, and ultimately, uh, again, if it says in the written document, they're a contractor, um, as you'll see, um, it's not going to necessarily be, be the case upon further scrutiny. Now to assist, to assist us in this task, uh, and I acknowledge the source, uh, again, rather than modifying some of this, I've tried to keep the source reference uh, or the material that I've drawn from the source uh, as consistent as absolutely possible um, in the presentation of these slides. Um, so that in fact, you know, if you're looking at something you can see uh, separate to this presentation, you can see that in fact, the material is exactly the same and um, you can actually be comfortable that we have not led you up the garden path. So, um, in the employment relationship, uh, labour is the combination of time, skill and effort. And it's typically in that employment context, it is what we as employees trade for the remuneration. In other words, it's what we're actually being paid for. Um, the express term as to whether we are employees or in dependent contractors, uh, is one of the things that is considered, but it's not the determining factor. And in actual fact, um, the leading case law uh, was a decision of the uh, High Court of Australia in the case of Hollis versus Vabu, Proprietary Limited. Um, it, it's actually quite interesting because the case related to a claim by Mr. Hollis against the company Vabu Proprietary Limited, which was a bicycle courier company. And it was actually one of the couriers, uh, the bicycle couriers that knocked over Mr. Hollis. And he was actually making a claim for compensation against the company. Um, but the matter was really looked at and developed further um, the indicia uh, that we look at to determine whether in fact a person is an employee or an independent contractor. Um, now, I do clearly out, uh, put my hand up here saying that in, again, in each individual case, the weight, the weight actually applied to each of these uh, indicia um, can be slightly different. 
Um, but this, uh, these are used as the clear guide um, in the common law. So uh, employee, as you can see there, it comes down to one of the key criteria is the level of control. So um, the level of control when it's performed, the hour of work, uh, the hours of work, typically uh, an independent contractor in the best terms is totally in control as to how and when the work is performed. Uh, the employee works for solely for the employer. Uh, typically an independent contractor not only performs work for one principal, but would do work for other principals uh, and they're genuinely entitled to do so. Uh, in relation to uh, advertising services, um, an employee doesn't advertise services, it's the employer who uh, would advertise goods or services of its own business, um, whereas an independent contractor um, is, should be uh, and generally is out there advertising their own services uh, to the world at large. Uh, another key criteria that are, that are taken into account uh, is uh, that the employer, in the case of an employee, the employer provides and maintains the significant tools or equipment. However, I, there is one rider on that uh, in the construction industry where uh, often tradespeople or specialty tradespeople will uh, carry their tools, but then again, there's allowances and things like that in the award. Uh, an independent contractor uh, provides and maintains significant tools or equipment, which is a key consideration in our industry because uh, that the key significant tool and or equipment is uh, really, to all intents and purposes, the vehicle. Um, now, in relation to delegating or subcontracting work, an independent contractor will typically, through the contract, be uh, allowed to subcontract or delegate. And now, the contracts where we do draft uh, independent contractor agreements for our members, uh, it is clear within certain provisions that, you know, during periods of um, uh, an independent contractor taking time away from work, they have the right then to engage another driver subject to uh, appropriate considerations of the principal. An employee, however, um, it's not like I can say to my boss, sorry boss, I've got a friend here who's gonna come in, to the, in for the day um, to do my work. Um, I don't think I'd be lasting as an employee pretty for very long. Uh, because I do not have that right to subcontract or delegate the work that's required of me. Um, then in relation to breaches or misconduct, uh, an employer has the right to suspend or dismiss uh, an employee. Um, as an independent contractor, it purely comes down to um, a breach of the contract and then the breach provisions or the termination provisions under that contract. Uh, you might have heard the old adage that, uh, you know, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. One of the key things that um, from an industrial perspective, we normally sort of use that catchphrase is around where the employer provides a uniform and then requires the contractor to wear that uniform as well. Um, typically under a contracting arrangement, because they're running their own business, a contractor wears uh, appropriate clothing, but uh, not necessarily the uniform of the principal. Uh, and again, getting into the, the, the taxation superannuation side of things, um, as an employee, we have PAYG uh, withholding applied to um, the payments made by our employer, whereas uh, an independent contractor is responsible for their own tax affairs. Another key distinction typically uh, looked at is uh, payment. Uh, as an employee um, paid periodically on a fixed period, be it weekly, fortnightly, monthly, uh, whereas typically um, 
the more sound contracting arrangements, um, the contractor provides invoices uh, either at the completion of the tasks or at uh, certain milestones within the contract. Uh, paid holiday sick leave is uh, a key element associated with uh, the employment relationship as an employee, uh, whereas an independent contractor, if they want to take time off or if they're unwell, um, that just simply comes down to um, an unpaid period um, or typically just um, a delay period within the contract. Um, again, not so much in our industry, but in the likes of construction, other areas um, where you get into the professional trade, it often more is uh, open to indicating that it, uh, it is more of a proper independent contractor than employee arrangement. Uh, one of the other key things, uh, again, equally applicable in this in, in the road transport industry is this thing called goodwill. Um, and the notion of there are a saleability of this goodwill. And anyone who has uh, friends who uh, probably at one stage many years ago operated uh, taxis and other things like that, um, often the cost of uh, on selling um, the taxi licensing arrangements or the plates um, involve significant amounts of money because uh, there was a, this notion of goodwill attached. So um, one of the key elements um, is that is looked at is that ability to genu generate, generate goodwill or it is that, that um, ongoing reputation and other things like that of being a good business, a good worker, a, uh, a good service provider. Now, um, again, as I indicated earlier, um, this the area of employment or industrial law uh, is definitely uh, sits in that common law area. And a recent decision, uh, in fact, so recent as July this year, uh, on first glance, uh, it could be seen to have perhaps uh, been another decision of the federal full court um, turning on its head um, a lot of the indicia or the conditions that we've come to accept as those things that we need to look at. However, uh, on further read of it, uh, it has largely continued to follow uh, the same principles or approach um, that have been used in other cases. And in fact, the multi-factor test established in Hollis versus Vibu, um was actually followed, although if anything, the bar was heightened. So the, the decision was in relation to two truck drivers who had worked for the same employer as contractors for 35 odd years. Um, and ultimately uh, the findings of the, the court were that in fact they weren't contractors, they were employees. Um, so in fact, this has a, a number of ramifications because not only were they found to be employees under the Fair Work Act, so uh, in relation to award entitlements, annual leave, paid personal carers leave or sick leave, uh, other entitlements provided under the award, but they were also found to be employees for the purposes of the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act and as workers under the long service leave legislation. In this case, I think it was New South Wales. Um, so as I said, uh, the key elements, the takeaways from this decision is that the court has raised, raised the bar in uh, consideration of the de degree of control and the level of independence required to be considered uh, a bona fide independent contractor. Now, the, the members of the full court did acknowledge that the two drivers had many of their features that we uh, associate with, or those indicia associated with uh, independent contractors. So um, significant investment in their truck, 
significant degree, degree of control over how they did their work, a series of agreements that uh, described them as independent contract carriers. Um, they'd actually set up their uh, business arrangements, the, this is the two truck drivers, as partnerships uh, to enable that uh, splitting of income with their spouses. Um, and they had uh, opportunity to increase uh, their profitability, including through choice of vehicle, uh, the organization of their run, finance options, and a range of other factors. Uh, however, uh, after acknowledging all those things in consideration, and as I said at the beginning, the courts look to how uh, the parties have actually materially behaved. So when it came down to it, the court's view was that the drivers, um, regardless of how everything was constructed, they had no real independence or effective controls in key aspects of their working relationship. Um, they were required to perform deliveries and things like that within uh, certain uh, times during the day. Um, they, they op while they had opportunity to uh, work for other businesses, given the level of uh, requirement, uh, the number of hours that they would work for this business and things like that, um, they never really had any opportunity and it was even acknowledged there was one occasion someone did some work on a weekend, but overall, largely, they, for the length of that, uh, worked for one employer. Um, and this goodwill, uh, because of the demands, the time demands and things like that, um, they weren't really able to get out there and promote their own business. Um, and therefore they were unable to generate that goodwill, uh, which could, if they eventually sold their truck on retirement or something like that, could actually increase that price they could ask for that business because of this goodwill element. And another key feature uh, was because uh, the contracts arrangements were offered on a take it or leave it basis, which for those who uh, do operate for companies, some of the larger companies around town. Um, I think you'd be most familiar. This is the contract. Uh, there's no room for negotiation. You either accept it or reject it. So as, as it says, uh, overall, the striking feature was the fact that they, there was a long and uninterrupted period where they'd worked for the company. And in fact, to all intents and purposes, um, were an integral part of that uh, business rather than being their own independent business. So uh, when it comes down to uh, these sort of things, a number of years ago, um, in response to a number of cases which had become before the courts where people were uh, basically bringing employees in and saying, well, look, we haven't gotten, uh, we can't, we've got no employment for you moving forward. However, if you get an ABN, we'll engage you as an independent contractor. Um, I don't know whether you may have recalled in the media, but uh, there were a number of cases in the cleaning area. So uh, dismissing employees as uh, on the basis that there was no work unless you were basically going to set yourself up as your own little business and we'll pay you as a contractor. Same sort of thing in the um, in some of the picking areas. Um, so in actual fact, section 357 of the Fair Work Act uh, actually addresses this uh, specific area. And it is, uh, as I said, the SRAM con sham contracting arrangements have been enshrined in the legislation, the Fair Work Act, and it's what we call uh, a general protection. So under the sham contracting arrangements or section 357 of the Fair Work Act, um, when you're engaging workers uh, as an employer, you can't pretend that you're offering um, someone 
work as an independent contractor when in actual fact, the position should be offered on the basis that uh, you're engaging an employee. You can't th dismiss, threaten to dismiss an employee for the purposes of engaging them as an independent contractor. And most importantly, you cannot make or knowingly make false statements to persuade or influence a person to become an independent contractor. And as I've got there at the bottom of the slide, the penalties are, in, in my uh, view, quite serious uh, of up to 12,600 for individuals. So for someone such as a director or even uh, myself, when I used to work for companies as a HR manager, um, I could be held to account. So I could be uh, liable for a, a penalty of up to 12,600. Uh, and for corporations up to 63,000. Uh, and this is for each contravention, not if, so if you were doing it for 10 people, um, that's 10, potentially 10 contraventions. So you could see that the amounts could add up pretty quickly. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, the next couple of slides in huge depth. And in actual fact, I could probably do a whole separate webinar on both of the next couple of slides. But as I flagged at the beginning, uh, there are risks in the superannuation space as well. So again, uh, using the term principle to recognize the fact that it's not just employees, but in some circumstances, independent contractors uh, can fall within the definition of employee for the purposes of the Superannuation Guarantee Act, uh, Administration Act. Um, so it's the principle, again, because we're talking independent contractor arrangements, principle, independent contractor, it is the onus is on the principle to establish that the relationship is a genuine principle independent contractor arrangement. So the principal must assess uh, each contractor that they engage on a case by case basis as to whether they fall within the definition of employee under the SGA. So the relevant section is section 12, subsection three. Um, if a person works under a contract that is wholly or principally for the labor of the person, then the person is an employee of the uh, principle. Uh, and the extension of that, because the tax, the Commissioner for Taxation puts out, loves to put out these uh, rulings, uh, Superannuation Guarantee Ruling or SGR 2005 slash one, forward slash one, um, has, quali has uh, qualified that uh, the extended definition of employee where it's being a contractor, uh, oops, uh, remunerated wholly or principally for personal labor and skills, uh, perform the work personally, that is there's no right of delegation and is paid on an hourly basis not to achieve a result. Um, Workers' compensation, uh, this is another area of risk. Um, now, the difficulty is the workers' compensation legislation varies by state and territory. So uh, each jurisdiction has its own legislation, which just makes that task even more challenging, uh, as if we don't have enough on our plates uh, when we're looking at employees or contractors. Um, so most authorities, apply a results test to determine whether a contractor for the purposes of workers' compensation legislation is really an employee or not. And again, this test generally requires uh, the establishing or for the person engaging them uh, to be able to demonstrate that they have been engaged to achieve a specified result as in build a shed at this location um, to this specification, this location with uh, meeting these requirements. Uh, they supply their own tools and equipment 
and if they hasn't been if the shed hasn't been constructed um, in accordance with the drawings and the requirements of council and everything uh, they are then responsible for fixing defects in their work now the significance of this is if you get it wrong uh, it will more likely than not result in the recalculation of your workers comp premium um, back payment of that and then on top of that imposition of penalties um, even worst case scenario is heaven forbid uh, the contractor who is ultimately found to be an employee under the workers compensation legislation has uh, or attempts has been injured and makes or attempts to make a claim um, they can also then recover the amount paid to the contractor in other words the injured person from you as the principal and then again the ultimate sting in the tail on top of that the imposition of penalties as i said from the superannuation and workers compensation perspective i haven't gone into great detail um, but it, richard and i are more happy to are most happy to speak to, with people um, but he, again the first in element is in the common law and the industrial uh, employment law area so um, again, there, there, there are uh, the ATO does look at uh, a range of items um, in relation to that contractor relationship from a tax perspective, also from state payroll tax and other things like that. There are also other issues there, um, and in fact, again, I could probably do a seminar, a webinar on each of those topics alone in the same time that. Um, we're together today. Um, so look, just to, to bring together what I've covered already, uh, in summary, when we're actually looking at whether we should engage a person or a worker as an employee or an independent contractor, um, brought together a couple of things. So uh, as good guidance, and this is based upon these things we call indicia that uh, the courts and those of us advising people uh, look at, uh, what instances are worker more likely to be considered an employee? So one of those required to wear a uniform, the other receiving regular wages or salary from which PAYG tax is withheld, um, ongoing expectation of work with regular or set hours. And this even acknowledges um, casual workers whose hours do vary. Um, the level of direction and control as to how work is performed. Um, so the employer has complete control in the case of an employee. Uh, typically the employer provides an employee with all the tools, equipment, training, and a place for them to do their job. Um, and in the case of a driver in the road transport industry, uh, that is typically driving the employer's vehicle because for a driver, their place of work is largely the cab of the vehicle. Um, in administrative type people, a dedicated office or workplace, supplies, personal protective equipment, induction, job specific training and other things like that. Um, and in fact, even where we have people working remotely, uh, so in other words, working from home, um, it still typically uh, doesn't get us away from being an employee. And overall, uh, at the end of the day, the employer is accountable or responsible for what we do as employees. Um, the cost of rectifying mistakes, the vicarious liability for, you know, if one employee is subjected to another employee to bullying and harassment and things like that. So uh, that is the situation uh, more likely to be considered an employee. Now let's have a look at uh, the contractor. So for a worker to be more likely considered to be a true bona fide independent contractor, uh, an independent contractor can largely determine the hours they want to work. They pay their own tax and GST. Uh, they are generally paid by results for a particular project, task or service that they're engaged to do. Um, and as an example that I've um, brought together for out of the industry, 
typically getting freight or goods from one location to another. Uh, they provide all or most of their tools uh, and do not receive any allowance for doing so. So if you're engaging an independent contractor um, in that driving space, then typically you're hiring the truck, which comes with the driver to actually get goods from A to B. Uh, so again, operating their own business independently and can accept or refuse additional work Oops, the slide didn't go. Uh, I've lost the slide. Um, but anyway, uh, those are the key elements. So um, now it comes down to um, passing you back to uh, Clara and if people have any questions. Thank you, David. Um, we do actually have one question. So um, Preetha's question is, can a contractor be asked to exclusively work for a business? If yes, are they entitled to, an, to employee benefits after a significant time period? Yes, so uh, as I've covered on, off on this and drawing upon that most uh, recent decision of the full federal court, um, the longevity of those arrangements, particularly where you're only working for one business, um, it will largely lead to that element of uh, more appropriately be considered as an employee and therefore entitled to uh, benefits under the national employment standards such as uh, paid leave uh, and then uh, other entitlements pursuant to the award um, such as uh, travel allowance and things like that. So uh, yeah, typically that's the case. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just give everybody a couple of minutes to see if there's any other questions. Um, but if not, um, you can always email your questions through to info at natbroad.com.au or um, our numbers on the screen. You can call our member services offer, offices. Um, let me just have a look. Yeah, perhaps perhaps we we leave it there, Clara. And yeah. uh, the members that are online, I think, uh, from having a quick look, uh, pretty familiar with um, Richard and myself. So yeah, yeah as uh, as we've said, don't hesitate to reach out to Richard or myself. Um, and Clara will be uh, making this slide presentation available on our website. Uh, uh, later today, won't we? Yes. Or yep. tomorrow? Then, yeah, either today or tomorrow. And we'll also send you um, an email with a link to it. Um, so yeah, great. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and yeah, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Thank you everyone for your attendance. Thank you. Have you have a good day. Bye.